do not want to stand through this 45-minute homily. <laughs> I don't know. I think that was nervous laughter. It's like, uh, you, you are joking, right, Bishop? <laughs> I'm a bishop. Am I supposed to joke, right? No, no. <laughs> I, the Lord of sea and sky, I have heard my people cry. All who dwell in dark and sin, my hand will save. I who made the stars of night, I will make their darkness bright. Who will bear my light to them? Whom shall I? In the words of St. Peter, Lord, it is good for us to be here today. In a very particular way, I welcome my brother Bishop, Archbishop Bernard Hebda, who has multiple responsibilities right now as shepherd. And thank you, my dear friend, for all you do for our Lord and his church. I didn't provide you a trailer at the beginning of Mass, but actually I've known Archbishop Hebda since 1989. Uh, believe it or not, he was not Archbishop Hebda back then. <laughs> he was Father Hebda, and he was in his fifth year of theology at the North American College, and I had just entered my first year of theology. And lo and behold, as divine providence would have it, we were next-door neighbors. And for a sizable fee, we'll share you, with you any news that we have of the other. <laughs> no, you can't afford us. <laughs> but what a blessing to begin my first year of theology right next door to Archbishop Hebda. Also, I thank again Father Sheridan for welcoming my brother, Archbishop, this day, as well as myself. This is home for me. And as I mentioned that the two youth conferences we've had this summer at Franciscan, this university, the programs we have here, are a blessing not simply to the Diocese of Steubenville, this 13-county footprint of a half a million people. It's greater than that. It's for all of the Americas throughout the world, but here I believe all the Americas are represented. We have South America as well represented. So. I made the mistake on my homily last time talking about the United States, and then I realized I had 200 cousins from Canada here as well. So I'm grateful for all of you to be here this day. Thank you, and Father Sheridan, thank you for the blessing Franciscan University is to my ministry, and of course, in particular, the Universal Church. I had a chance to review the names of our speakers for these past two and a half days. And if I may stick with a sports metaphor, what a starting lineup. <laughs> the Yankees and the Royals and the Cardinals have, well, I've got to be careful about Cardinals. It does have another meaning. <laughs> <laughs> they have nothing on this starting lineup. So it's amazing when you attract excellence like this, you recognize the integrity of a program. So I'm very grateful to be sort of the caboose of the train here this day. I guess you would say I'm one of those riding on the bench and now it's my turn to come up to the plate. The first 18 years of my priesthood I spent in the Archdiocese of Detroit in Michigan. <laughs> that was your Episcopal shout out. 
okay? I'm very grateful for the service I was able to provide, and I was at St. Andrew's Parish, and of all things, I ran into three former parishioners from St. Andrew's at our clothing center, the Samaritan House, just last Friday. So it brought back good memories. That's where I departed from to become the shepherd here in the Diocese of Steubenville. Well, so happens my first assignment as a pastor was at St. Therese of Lisieux Parish in Shelby Township. And in 2005, that July, I followed the founding pastor. Now, yes, the parish was relatively young. It wasn't around for 100 years, and so was he. It was, a, it was founded in 1990. I followed Father Tom Sutherland, a good, holy man. Well, when you're coming in as your first assignment, a parish of 2,500 families, and you're following the founding pastor, that can be a bit overwhelming, daunting, if I may. The bar is set high. The first thing I did was get rid of that bar because ultimately, it's Jesus. And it doesn't make a difference where you're at in your abilities. It's the holiness to which he calls you and me, the pastors, in a very particular way, to serve him. And so I was able to utilize the gifts that he gave Jeff Monfortin, as limited as they are. And as we approached the Advent season, I realized working with the other priests in the vicariate, we needed to have a reconciliation service at St. Therese as well. And so what I did is I determined it was important for us to have a dinner first before the reconciliation service. The dinner was for the priests. I hope that they were going to show up. I got 15. <laughs> you feed them and they will come. And that applies also to priests. It applies to bishops as well. So we had 15 show up. And so one of the priests took me to the side right after dinner, before the service, and he goes, Jeff, he goes, 15 priests? You better make this worth my time. As we were processing into the church proper, we had recognized there were over 600 penitents. He looked at me, he goes, you're not paying us enough. <laughs> but what a terrific blessing. Maybe you can't have too many priests for reconciliation service, but you can never have enough penitents. Thank you. Thank you, you were on cue who started the clap there. I appreciate that. <laughs> no, the bottom line is, there was an anxiety that came over me when I looked inside, I saw the 600 plus people. Oh my, are we gonna be able to do this? Because it was seven o'clock when the service began and it was a Monday, which means that nine o'clock was Monday night football. Uh, we have to work within the context of the people, correct? That's how to evangelize. We were able to finish on time, and the individual confessions worked well, and the priest truncated his homily a little bit, no, a lot, so that we were able to move forward with the individual confessions. I could have allowed the anxiety to get over me, saying this isn't going to work. Oh my gosh, what can we do? Or, as I do often in my ministry, Lord, this is in your hands. I've done the preparation as much as I can to my ability, and it works. Lord, it seems like we have too many people. Does that not echo today in our minds and hearts in the gospel passage? Last Sunday, we heard how Jesus took note of the people coming to him were like sheep without a shepherd. Well, today we leap from the gospel according to Mark to the gospel according to John, both the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Jesus' compassion for these people, these thousands, translates into the multiplication of the loaves and fishes. We can glean at least two purposes from this result or ends. Jesus' divinity manifests itself before the people. And Jesus provides explicit instruction to his apostles 
feed my sheep. Their work, as Jesus shows, will transcend this visible world of ours, this material world, because Jesus' authority is greater. And the church will continue with that authority in feeding his sheep. Did we not hear with our own ears our first reading, the second book of Kings? It echoes the implausible task to feed the sheep beyond our material means placed before us. And yet, through the prophet Elisha, it happens. St. Paul, in his letter to the faithful in Ephesus, actually, we're talking about the world, word of God, so the letter to the faithful here in Steubenville in the Finnegan Fieldhouse this day, explains to you and I that through, through our singular faith in Jesus Christ, our Lord and God, anything, all things are possible regardless the numbers, regardless the daunting task. In this media world of ours, it is not breaking news that you and I live in an increasingly secular and cynical world. A prevailing spiritual apathy or atrophy endures among our brothers and sisters, even in family members. This very fact, though, should embolden, galvanize our hearts rather than foster despair. Our ardent desire to share Jesus and his sacred and compassionate heart is fed this weekend at this conference, culminating, culminating in the solemn celebration of the word and sacrament, the sacrament of the Eucharist, Jesus' body and blood. This day, you and I recognize the multiplication of the loaves and fishes is more than a metaphor for our Christian service, just as the Eucharist is more than a memorial of the Last Supper. This day reminds us who is the source of our faith. This day places the prophet's mantle of Elisha on your shoulders and mine. This day, you and I allow Jesus' very gratitude, his thanksgiving, the Eucharistia, to penetrate our minds and hearts. This day strengthens our resolve to serve our Lord Jesus joyfully. Anxiety for what comes next, that is not a Christian virtue. Hope in the Lord Jesus. As we hear in Scripture today, he knows what he's going to do before you and I realize it. He will feed his sheep. I, the Lord of wind and flame, I will tend the poor and lame. I will set a feast for them. My Finest bread I will provide Till their hearts be satisfied I will give my life to them Whom 
shall I send? Here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I have heard you call. God bless you.